uh, elimination is to get rid of the sub's equity to the degree of the book value of the investment. So if you're trying to get the investment down to zero, what do you do? You eliminate the book value of the investment, which is equivalent to the subsidiary's equity. So even though the intention here is to eliminate the subsidiary's equity at time of acquisition, you actually eliminate also the, that portion out of the investment account. So your intention here is to get rid of the subsidiary's book value out of your investment account. What's left in your investment account is the excess over book value to fair value. So what do you do with that? You eliminate that excess in journal entry A by crediting the investment account. To what degree do you credit that? Is the value of the fair value, the excess fair value of the assets, including the goodwill? So you, in a way, you're you're bringing in the excess of the fair value of the assets to the consolidated sheet, and you're also bringing in the goodwill. Keep in mind what ends up in the consolidated report here. You're summing up the two companies' book value of assets. What you paid for, right? And basically, you're looking just at the financials of both companies, and you're just summing. Current assets, patents, trademarks, you're just summing. But what's missing? The excess of the fair value. Because that's, you know what I mean? Like, the reason you have this entry is because if you just go summing, you're going to miss this excess fair value piece because that's not in the financial statements of the subsidiary or the parent. This piece only appears on the consolidated worksheet. That's the only place where you capture this markup from book value to fair value. That's the only place you'll see it. So you gotta put that in because you wanna include the fair value markup of these assets on the consolidated total. So you do that and the goodwill. This is where the goodwill comes in. And the goodwill. And this happens to equal 200. Is that a coincidence? No. There's very rare coincidences in accounting. Um, so it's the idea is that why is it not a coincidence? Because we've seen this number before, no? What was the 200? We've seen it. That was the excess, which included the assets and the goodwill. So all we did was translate that table that we looked at earlier into the journal entry. That's all we did. We bucketed it into the journal entry because why? Because that excess is what we're looking to put on the consolidated report. We're going to use the consolidated worksheet to do that via journal entry A. So the intention of journal entry A is to first mark up the assets to their fair value, second, record the goodwill, and third, eliminate the equivalent amount of those two out of the investment account. So that's sort of why, that's like why we're doing it. How we're doing it is the next is the next level. I think you guys know how we're doing it because we saw the numbers before. You know, we saw the numbers, so that's okay. Um, and then journal entry I is like, you know, a year went by, so now we just have to eliminate the income that we accrued this year. You know, the purchase happened at Jan 1, and since Jan 1, we had income and expenses. So we had income of 100 and expenses of 7, so we accrued 93. That hit the investment account, so now we eliminate that, get rid of it. So we eliminate the income and subsidiary, because right now our income and expenses are just going to be combined, so we don't need this account anymore, and the related amount out of the investment account. Right? And dividend... We just adjust for the fact that we had a dividend. It reduced our investment balance, so we have to update it because the dividend doesn't really impact the intercompany situation so much. Any questions on this, guys? Is it clearer with these journal entries? Clear now? Okay. All right, so let's take a few minutes to go over goodwill. I want to just, this is the, the next piece here of goodwill and other things.
want to go over Goodwill and then introduce the new material. So in terms of Goodwill, you know, subsequent to the years of acquisition, we have to examine this underlying asset that created the Goodwill. We want to make sure that um, there's still that excess. What is Goodwill? It's the excess that we originally recorded because there was the purchase price exceeded the fair value. Purchase price of what? Of a specific asset, of a company. That company is now where? Well, we still own it. It's out there in the market. It's still operating. So years down the line, I'm checking. I'm like, oh, well, you know, Microsoft, we acquired Apple. You know, three years down the line, what's going on with Apple? Like, let's see, like, what's the fair value? Like, what's the fair value of this asset now? And does the fair value exceed the carrying value? So what is carrying value, guys? What is carrying value? This could be book value, but in reality, if I'm Microsoft and I bought Apple three years ago, what's the carrying? What's ever it being carried at now? On the book. And where do we keep it? In the investment account. That's it. In a way, think about when we talk, say in the intermediate guys, when we took intermediate, when I said carrying value, I meant always the current balance of the asset on the balance sheet. So carrying value, same thing for this, like say we own Apple, we're Microsoft, the carrying value is going to be the investment account as stated on the balance sheet. And what do we know about the investment account? It starts off with the purchase price and then gets hit with t five types of transactions. So we've just been following those rules all for three years now. Does fair value exceed the carrying value? So what are you imagining? If I bought Apple three years ago for $20 billion, now my carrying value is $22 billion. So I bought three years ago for $20 billion. Now, on my books and records, it says $22.5 billion on Microsoft. What does it mean? Does fair value exceed carrying value? So what does it mean? What is it what is what does it mean that's going on here exactly is that you know I bought originally Apple for twenty billion, so the fair value must have been twenty billion, because that's what I paid for it. But now I'm carrying it at twenty two point five billion, but you know, it looks like it's trading at nineteen billion, so it's only nineteen billion that it's worth now. So what's going on here? Is the care is does the fair value exceed carrying value? No. In fact, the carrying value the carrying value is more than fair value three and a half billion. So we have a three and a half billion excess, right? So in a way, now we can talk about the impairment because we're looking at this fair value of reporting in the exceed exceed the carrying value. So what does it mean? If this number, for example, of fair value exceeds, say this number was 25, do I have to worry about impairment? No, because you're like, listen, I, you know, I clearly the value of the asset is more than I'm recording it at, so I wouldn't have to like start recording losses and adjustments. It makes no sense. It's fine. So no, no is not impaired. No further testing required. No, a second step must be taken for the impairment test. You basically allocate Apple now the fair value to all the departments and the assets, and you start to, you're starting to see um, what is the value of the net assets. You want to figure out what is the value of the net assets of Apple, 
and you want to see um, the implied goodwill and the recorded goodwill, right? So you want to now figure out the implied goodwill and the recording goodwill. So for example, if it's being carried at 22.5, right? And you know when we bought it, say the book value was 17 billion, so we recorded three billion dollars in goodwill back then, and now book value is still 17 billion, so implied goodwill is two billion. So what's going on here now? In a way, with this new evaluation at 19 billion, I'm seeing an implied goodwill of only two billion. Are you seeing that? You guys agree? In a, in a way, what happened was, yeah, we lost some value, and now, instead of uh, three billion in goodwill, we have two billion in goodwill. So what's the idea? We should have a, a one billion dollar impairment. You know, and that's when you get to sort of this chart of understanding, yes, there was a devaluation, and now what we have to do is figure out the value of the goodwill. And now is the implied fair value of goodwill less than the carrying amount. So you figure out the fair value of the goodwill is actually two billion and the carrying value of the goodwill is three billion. So you're like, okay, I have a mismatch. My goodwill is worth three billion. The reality on the ground is telling me that goodwill is worth two billion. So I have to make an adjustment. How do you make an adjustment to goodwill? This, basically, what you do is you revalue it. So I'm like, okay, the goodwill is actually two billion. It's not three billion. So I'm gonna credit the goodwill amount by one billion, and I'm gonna debit impairment, impairment of goodwill as an income statement account for one billion. For this whole idea of outside ownership. You know, what does it mean to have outside ownership? It means that you basically have a company where the parent acquires 80% of a company and 20% the remaining piece is owned by the investee company. So for example, um, I was talking last class, say Facebook, I don't know the exact amount of the IPO percentage, but usually with IPOs, we don't know the percentage IPOs. I don't know how much that IPOs, but say the IPO was 70%. That means 70% of the company is owned by the public. Say Mark Zuckerberg now only owns 20% and 10% may be owned by some hedge funds or investment firms still. So Mark Zuckerberg is actually a minority interest owner of a company called Facebook. It's majority owned by the public. You know, and if you look on the internet, you could always get the top 10 shareholders. It will be probably some hedge funds, pension funds, mutual funds. And then um, a lot of institutional investors, like insurance companies, and you'll see that that's the, the true owners of Facebook. You know, how does that play out in the game of management? You know, hedge funds sometimes like they like to control, so they come in and say, you know, we want to change the board around, we want to change the lawyers, we want to change the auditors, we want a fresh look. You know, we nominate a new CFO, things like that. They can shake you up a little bit. If you're a minority owner, you may not have. Uh, your choice on who the lawyer is or who your you know, CEO is. Or it could be like, listen, he still owns 30% of the company. He likes to have his own management. No, you know, he's still deeply rooted in there. We're like not looking to change anything. We like what he's doing. Leave it the way it is. Whatever he wants to do, let him do it. And it could be like that. But a minority owner, in a way, that's what it is. And a lot of times that happens. In companies, you know, like Visa was IPO, maybe, but the family maybe kept 10%. You know, may, why, would you, why would you keep a certain percentage? You know, it's basically you keep it because you don't, maybe the value will double in two, three years. So you want to, you know, with something, you know, with Facebook, say it IPO at a $50 billion valuation, you know, maybe in three years it's going to be worth $150 billion. So, you know, that 30% stake is now worth $50 billion, $15 billion. But in three years, that 15 billion will be worth 30 billion. So he's like, listen, I want to give it some time, maybe give it 10, 20 years. You know, let's see what happens. So people don't want to sell out the whole thing, right? And when you're buying a foreign subsidiary, a lot of times foreign companies don't like to sell the whole company. 
right? A lot of times when you look at um, like oil companies going to Africa and buying companies there, or Chinese companies now trying to buy up um, oil and coal in Africa, a lot of times those companies, they don't let you buy the whole asset. They want, they'll give you tax because why? They want to retain control of the local asset, you know, if it's, a, it's an oil company, they don't, they're not going to give it the entire thing away because they want to keep the infrastructure, they want to keep the control of the flow of the resource, and ultimately it's a way to sort of have that additional check in terms of who controls the power. Now we're going to start looking at it from a reporting perspective. How do you record this outside ownership? on the consolidated financial statement. So if the parent consolidates the subsidiary 100%, right, but 20% of this whole structure of the subsidiary is actually owned by somebody else, what happens, you'll start seeing is, in the equity, it will say non-controlling interest in the equity sector. And that means this amount of equity is owned by an outside owner. And we're just showing you on our financial statement that there's a piece of, our, of the company that is not owned by us, right? So that's sort of the idea of what's going on here. And that gets consolidated in, and we're showing it on the parent side. So some of the complexities that appear in terms of having a minority interest is that you have to keep track of the balance of the minority interest as a roll forward. It's kind of like the investment account, like you want to keep track of the balance of the minority interest because it starts as a certain balance and what does it accrue? What does it start accruing? It starts accruing allocations of income. It starts, it starts accruing distributions of dividends. It starts accru accruing uh, amortizations of the deferral of assets and things like that. So in a way, the minority interest it's an, it appears like an equity investment inside of your company that just belongs to a foreign uh, shareholder. So in a way, everything you do with the investment account, you also do with the minority interest. And that's sort of the way to work with it is to update it to its appropriate balance. So I want you guys to sort of go through this piece and work on the valuation of the minority interest. It would be good before next lecture. I'm going to sort of next lecture review a little bit chapter three, you know, go over some things. I didn't get a chance to go over some of that homework. I'm, I'm going to go over a little bit of that 10 next time. So a few more days, we'll go, you know, take a look at the homework one more time. And please, guys, read these slides in terms of what's going on with the minority interest because I'm going to go into the technical aspects of how to roll forward the minority interest from start to finish, and you want to go over the example in the book to get a fresh understanding of how you do this and how you work with that consolidated, um, in the consolidation sheet, we add another column called minority interest. So I want you guys to work with that, and we'll have an example on how to roll it forward. Okay? Any other questions, guys? Anything that's going on now? The hedge fund, we have the hedging case study. Yeah, Gary. Oh, the next homework due is going to be Monday night. So I'm going to post the next homework tomorrow for chapter four. We're going to have the homework for chapter four, then go over homework on Tuesday, and then Thursday we'll do an exam review.